We thank you that it will endure forever, that all these things in the world may pass away, but your word will remain true and it will last. We can trust in it and we can turn to it to know your will, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for his teaching and we pray that he is present here today, helping us as we go through Zechariah. It is a complex book and I pray for your wisdom, Lord, as we go through it. May you reveal the truth in your word. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, and we thank you for your, the repentance that we can be had there, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through the Minor Prophets, and last time uh, we were going to Haggai, and what we learned there was these are, this next book, Zechariah, they are concurrent books. They run together. Um, they, they both happen at the same time. These two prophets were called at the same time to deliver messages to Israel. So we've been going through the minor prophets, and we know that now we are coming through the second of the post-exile minor prophets. So this is after the 70 years of Babylonian exile. Um, this is after the warnings they've been getting for quite some time. Now Ezra 1, we're going to turn there real quick, just to give you a brief uh, of what's going on here. Ezra 1, 1 through 4 covers a little bit of this. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, beside, uh, besides the freewill offerings of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So again, we have this foreign ruler who has supplanted the Babylonian Empire. Cyrus the Great has come in and conquered Babylon, as we learned, because again, Nineveh had fallen, weakening the Assyrian Empire, weakening the Babylonian Empire, allowing the P Medo Persian Empire to come in with Cyrus the Great. Now, as we learned, these books are all running concurrent with some of the other books of the Bible. Uh, Second Chronicles 36 22 to 23 records that in the year of the first king of uh, Cyrus of Persia, in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all of his kingdom and also declared a written edict. Thus says the king of uh, Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go. Now, as we get into Zechariah, I'm going to give you some backstory and some, some information because Zechariah is an interesting book. It is considered one of the books of apocalyptic literature, which is complex. C apocalyptic means revelation. And as we get revelation from, and if anyone who's read Revelation, it's kind of weird. There's a lot of imagery that doesn't make sense. And apocalyptic literature in the Bible is veiled literature that shows you things that God is revealing in time. These are complex things, and they have a lot of background. And so the key point I want to make is that Zechariah starts off with real history. So though it is an apocalyptic book with weird imagery, there is real factual history on it. In fact, this, this edict of Cyrus the Great was often thought to be fake. They thought before um, anyone actually discovered anything in ar archaeology that this was just some made-up thing that may have happened, that there was no real edict from Cyrus the Great, that it, none of this ever really happened, that Cyrus existed, but maybe they just lost power over the Jews, maybe they just went away, and so it was always this fable that, oh, Cyrus the Great had said these things about the Jews, and this is what happened. Um, however, history does record some other things. Um, classical uh, Hebrew sources in Josephus actually records this. Um, Josephus records that Cyrus at one point gave an edict, I have given leave as to as many of the Jews that dwell in my country as pleased to return to their own country and to rebuild their city and to build the temple of God at Jerusalem. On the same place where it was before, I have also sent my treasurer, Mithrandet, and Zerubbabel, the governor of the Jews, 
that they may lay the foundations of the temple and may build it 60 cubits high and at the same latitude making it three edifices of polished stone and one of wood of the country. And the same order extends to the altar whereon they offer sacrifices to God. I recall, I require also that the expenses for that things may be given out of my revenues. And this is where it gets interesting. Moreover, I have also sent the vessels which King Nebuchadnezzar pillaged out of the temple and have given them to Mithraandrus, the, the treasurer, and to Zerubbabel, the governor of the Jews, that they may have them carried to Jerusalem and may restore them to the temple of God. Now their numbers is as follows, 50 charges of gold, 500 of silver, 40 Thracian cups of gold, 500 of silver, 50 bastions of gold, 500 of silver, 30 vessels for pouring the drink offering, 300 of silver, 30 vials of gold, 2,400 of silver with a thousand other large vassals. I permit them to have the same honor which they were used to have from their forefathers, as also for the small cattle and for the wine and oil, 205,500 drachmae, and for wheat, flour, 20,500 um, I don't know what that artebe. It's like I'm sure it's a, it's a unit of measure. Um, so in other words, Josephus records this, and later in archaeology, the cylinder of Cyrus the Great was found, an ancient clay cylinder inscribed with the declaration in the name of Cyrus, referring to the restoration of temples and reparations of exiled pe people. It has been taken as many scholars as collaboration of the authenticity of the Bible accounts attributed to Sirius. So we are going to look at a book full of weird imagery, strange things. But from the very start, it records truth in history. So it may start off with real history and then go into these fanciful things. But the real history happened. So these fanciful things are prophecies coming from the Lord. And Zechariah 1 opens with real events. In the eighth month of the second year of Dar Darius. Now, Darius was the ruler that supplanted Cyrus. Cyrus's reign ended in 530. This is around the time, just after he gave the decree, Darius then stepped up. So it was right at the end of Sirius' reign that the decree was given for the Jews to return. And in the eighth month of the second year of Darius's reign, this is when Zechariah. So they've already been in the land. They already were told. It says, The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, son of Bar Bareshi, the son of Edu, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts. I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Now, Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. He remembers. And that it matters because the Lord remembers his promises. How many warnings did their fathers ignore? How many times did the Jews hear this, this warning that was coming from them? Now, the Lord's telling them, don't be like your fathers. Don't be like the people that came before you who didn't listen to me. Because the Lord is patient. And throughout all the minor prophets, we should have seen that. He's patient. How many years of warning did they get through the minor prophets? Two, three hundred years for a 70-year exile. Jeremiah warned them. They were warned constantly through Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. And now all is Zephaniah. All of them were warning. So for 300 years, the Lord was patient. And the Lord was very calm and very just, look, you guys are going to get punished. You guys are going to get punished. And then they did. And now he's promising, again, Zechariah, it means God remembers. He remembers these promises. He's telling them, the Lord is telling them through Zechariah, don't forget. Don't you remember what your fathers did? Because remember what happened in Haggai. The whole thing in Haggai was about the temple. Because everyone got all up in arms and let's go build the temple. They got there and suddenly they're like, oh, let's just, this is too hard. We got, we're going to go build our own house. We're going to go do our own thing. And the call in Haggai was to rebuild the temple. Build the temple. And Ze uh, Zechariah is coming on the scene. And it's more to the people now. Because that was more to the leadership, to the priest. This is now to the people. Don't be like your fathers. Don't, don't do those things. You've got to listen to me. 
And that's what he's trying to tell them because the anger of the Lord was because of their evil deeds. And he's telling them, you need to repent. You need to heed me. So you get this image of the father just being like, look, I had to punish you. I had to spank you. Do you want me to do it again? And that's what he's pleading with Israel in the painting in the opening. And he tells them, he goes on, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statues, which I have commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? And so he's telling them, look, the wicked, where are they? They're dead. The righteous, where are they? They're dead. What remains? The word of the Lord. It will always remain. It will always be true. The wicked and the righteous will pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. His promises will never pass away. Because we, compared to the Lord, as James 4.14 uh, 4, tells us, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Yet in comparison, Matthew 5.18 tells us, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till it is fulfilled. We are nothing compared to the Lord. He is not a respecter of people. The, rich, the wicked and the righteous will all perish. But what matters is his word and his edicts. Are you following what he said? And the people actually heard this and they listened. So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. So they can't argue. They can't, they can't, it's, you're right. We messed up. It's bad. So they, they listen to the prophet. Now, this is where Zechariah's message goes from the practical. Just turn back. Stay with us. Come back to God. Follow the Lord. It switches over to the visions that he has. Zechariah has ten consecutive visions. Zechariah is probably one of the most Messiah-focused of the prophet, the minor prophets. His visions go through uh, various apocalyptic visions. And the reason I'm bringing these visions up, because we have to remember something about parables, allegories, and visions in the Bible. These words that are used, these terms that are used, matter. They tie together with other references in the Bible. So as an example, if a red horse means something one time, the next time the red horse appears, it means the same. When brass is shown as a symbol of judgment, when the serpent is held up, the brass serpent is held up in Exodus, and that is shown as a serpent of, uh, symbol of judgment, later times when brass is shown in the Bible, it is for a symbol of judgment. So it's, it's kind of a key thing to remember. You have to take the Bible as a whole. These concepts get pretty deep and complex as we go through. This is probably going to be the longest book of the minor prophets we're going to go through. Just because these visions really do have to be picked apart a little bit. You have to be willing to go into them in order to understand. So what we're going to open with is the vision of horses. So on the, and this is, opens up in seven. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is uh, the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the son of Bacchariah, the son of Edo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were the horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. Thankfully, most times in the Bible, when they're going to give you a vision or a prophecy, oftentimes, just like us, we're confused, and thankfully, so are the prophets. And so they will just ask the angel that's with them, What is this? And thankfully, the Lord will often answer. Now, it's interesting to me about these horses because four horses we are seeing here. Um, horses usually imply riders, and they're usually messengers. Um, one red, or two red, one brown, and one white. Now, some commentators like to tie these with the Revelation, the Revelation horses, the four horses of the apocalypse. You can't really do that because there's one red, one white, one pale, one black. So they don't completely line up with that message. But what do is the red. Because the red horse was the rider who was given the authority to take away peace from the world. And that's interesting because if we go in here and as we see, and as the explanation comes, he goes, and the man who stood among the, mortal, the myrtle trees answered and said, 
These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So first, they're going about the earth and exploring. These are angelic messengers exploring the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord. And we're going to take apart that one right now in a little bit. Who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. So the red horses are going out. The peace horses. And they're coming back saying, The earth is resting quietly quietly. And we're going to go back to that in a little bit, but I want to poke apart the one thing here. So the answered the angel of the Lord. Now, doctrines surround the angel of the Lord that you have to be very careful with. Doctrines that some cults have taken and twisted. Now, we all know you cannot see God and live. That's a simple thing to understand. We also know that God is a spirit. No man has seen the Father. Those are verses that rely to that. So anytime we see the angel of the Lord, we have to begin to wonder, what is going on with this? Now, there are doctrinal cases to be made that it is a pre-incarnate Christ. That is what I lean toward. That's what I view it as. That's what everything makes sense when you read it. And I'll give you why. So the first time we see the angel of the Lord, it's to Hagar. And this is the first recorded appearance of the angel of the Lord. And he said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted in multitude. The angel said he himself would multiply the descendants of Hagar. Not God. The angel of the Lord said, I will multiply the descendants of Hagar. She answers him, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So Hagar's very own response to the angel of the Lord shows you this is not an angel. Because all angel means messenger. That's all it means. This is a messenger for the Lord, the person who speaks with the Lord's voice. And so her response to the angel of the Lord, she views him as God who sees her. Now Abraham and Sarah. Three men appear to Abraham and his wife Sarah at the plains. Now in this whole thing, it's clearly explained that the angel of the Lord is speaking for God. So Abraham, who did he see? Who did he talk to? Who was he encountering? Once we know later on, you can't see God. Who was this angel of the Lord? The angel appeared many times to Jacob. He said, um, and when he, in his dreams, Jacob answered and said, here I am, as in responding to God. And again, when J Jacob responds to the angel of the Lord, he called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So he saw the angel of the Lord, and his response was, I've seen God face to face, because I saw the angel of the Lord. Now Moses in the burning bush. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire within the bush. Moses saw that through the bush the fire did not burn. Then the angel explained who, it was, who he was. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And again, it's the angel of the Lord speaking. Now, later, Stephen the martyr would emphasize this point, because he tells him, and after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. So who is that angel? The angel quoted himself as being God. So who is that if no one's ever seen God? So as you start developing this thing about this angel of the Lord, it starts to become really clear. There's something special about the angel of the Lord. And you can go through Joshua. You can see Gideon. You can see uh, Samson's parents. All these people who encountered the angel of the Lord took it as, this is God. Now, the thing with this is, you have to realize this is Jesus. Because there's only one other, there's only a few conclusions you can make about this. Either A, God can randomly decide to turn to a angel form and appear to man, which the Bible does not say. Two, that this is an, an angel of highest authority that this can speak on the Lord's behalf. But then there's times where it says that things were created through this angel. So that makes no sense. And this is where I go with um, the false doctrines that come up. 
because the Jehovah's Witnesses take it as meaning that the angel of the Lord was the angel Mar Michael, and that the angel Michael at some point got promoted and became the Messiah, Jesus. Cults twist this doctrine when they don't understand it, when they don't take the word at its word and really develop it and really look into it. Because there's this thing that starts to happen when you see things that don't make sense in the Bible. And this is one of the things that we're going to address too. Because we know who the angel of the Lord is. And we know that. That we know that it's Jesus. So we're going to go back a little bit. Now, back to the point he was making about the peace in the world. Remember he said the horses were going out. So these writers are all going about exploring the earth. Why are they reporting to this angel? Because he's Jesus. That's why these, this is why this angel of the Lord has this authority to go, go out and check on the earth. See what's going on. Now, one of the things that is going on here, and it says that, but the world's at peace. So why is, why is that mentioned there? Why is that brought out, that the world is at peace? It's because the world's at peace with Israel being in ruined. The world is at rest. Israel is desolate, and the world is at rest. They're okay with it. They're okay with Israel being destroyed. They're okay with the Jews being scattered. And you see that start to develop as it goes on. Because it says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? So keep in mind, angel of the Lord, Jesus, seeing the world at peace with his people being scattered, they report back to him. And what does he do? And again, this is going toward what Jesus would do. What would Jesus do when he sees his people hurting? He would be their advocate, would he not? Would he not step up and go, wait a second. O oh Lord of hosts, how long have you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the city of Judah against which you were angry these seven years? He's upset. Lord, these are our people. He's being the advocate. And it reminded me of Luke 13, 34, where he goes, O oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills their prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often have I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing so you see, they've just faced this punishment and the angel of the Lord is responding much like you would expect Jesus to respond. Lord, we got to do something. These are our people. And he's being the advocate. And then the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good comforting words. So the angel spoke with me and said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. For I was angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. So you get the advocate advocating for Israel, and then you get the Lord. And this is what we have to be careful with, because I, I wanted to bring up a lot of Cyrus information and a lot of information on Cyrus, because we may have heard that name thrown around quite a bit recently. Someone's the next Cyrus, and someone's doing this. And, some, and so my point being is this. The Lord uses the nations around Israel and other nations for Israel's purposes. And Israel is God's people. And as it says, I am zealous for Jerusalem. God is zealous. He is his people. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. So he's mad at the nations for how they treated Israel. How they treat Israel will directly affect how a nation is judged. And he goes, I was mad at Israel, and they helped. So he's using these nations to help, but they did it with evil in their heart. They were not helping Israel to make Israel better. They weren't punishing Israel to make Israel better at the end of it. They weren't coming alongside Israel to do God's will. They were coming up to Israel with greedy little hands, getting their own little piece of the pie. So we have to be careful because the Lord will use nations all around Israel to accomplish his good. He will use the wicked to do righteous things in the name of Israel. But they're going to be judged no matter what. Whether that whole thing was by the Lord's hand, their evil in their heart will be used against them. 
The Lord will use the wicked for his purpose that does not exempt them from their own punishment. So yes, Israel deserved punishment. And yes, the world was used as its vessel to be done with. But the Lord remembers his promises. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. mercy. My house shall be built, built in it, says the Lord. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Who's ever owned property? Who knows how important it is to have a proper survey of your land? You hear stories every now and then where a neighbor goes to move his fence and then finds out that's not his fence. His property is three feet over and that's no longer his property. And that legal battle that could ensue can take years to get resolved. And we often see these things happen with property just in the human level. And we see what happens when the government steps in and decides you're wrong. It's not your property. It's that guy's property. And you have to trust these measurements. But the Lord is saying, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy, and my house shall be built. So the Lord's going to build his house. And the Lord's the surveyor. He's a much more strict surveyor than any human will ever be. So whenever people start talking about Israel, they need to remember who's surveying that land. Now, there's a thing with prophecy that I must bring up. Because there is a near far view in prophecy where often there is a near application to the people it's speaking to and a far view. You can view this because there's sometimes in the prophecy aspects of the prophecy that haven't been fulfilled. And I would take this surveyor line as being one of them because if the Lord's measuring Jerusalem's proper and Israel proper, who knows how big that should be. It should include all the way from the Nile in Egypt, all the way past the Saudi Arabian Peninsula to the largest piece of land that's there. That's the proper lines that were promised to Abraham that Israel has never gotten. So when le- the Lord is the surveyor, we know that it's probably a prophecy a little bit about the future as well because these things have not yet happened. Again, proclaim saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My, shi- my cities shall it, uh, again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So Israel is going to be blessed. It's going to spread out. Now, at that point, we know that Israel did get a little blessed. The temple was built. But again, it didn't spread out like it was, like it said. And then it moves on suddenly to the next vision. And this is the vision of horns. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he answered, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen and said, What are these these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nation that lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Now this is a little weird. But we do know that horns often symbolize Gentile rulers. Various commentators waffle on what these horns may mean. Going from the near and the far view of prophecy, we can look at it that most likely these are the Gentile nations that were originally mentioned in the minor prophets. Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. Because they had scattered Israel. And if we go, and we're not going to go there now, but I'll just read briefly. Um, Ezekiel goes through these lists of these Uh, Gentile horns are these nations that had been over Israel. Ammon was haughty over Israel's misfortune, given to the people of the east, wiped out. And this is all in Ezekiel 25. um, And it goes on, Moab, haughty over uh, Judah's misfortune, given to the people of the east, not remembered. Edom, complicit over Judah's misfortune, laid waste, killing of men and beasts by the hand of Israel. Philistia, uh, complicit over Judah's misfortune, uh, wipe out of the Cretheans and destroys, uh, destroyed along the coast. So those are the horns that are believed. Now here's the other thing. The far view of this prophecy views that these horns might be a little bit based on the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the vision of the statue and the nations. Um, the four beasts of Daniel are, the four kingdoms. Uh, that's the Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian and the Roman Empire. Because those are all nations that would end up conquering Israel. Now, there is another view of these craftsmen, though, which is that in this point, the craftsmen are those that knock 
down those Gentile nations. Those craftsmen being, again, the Babylonian and the Persian and the Greek and the Roman. So you really have to dig into this because there's various commentators that view different things depending on what you're reading. Because if you're thinking about it from a messianic viewpoint in the future, then it makes sense that these horns would be maybe those statues from Daniel, maybe those beasts, maybe those different ones. But in the very near interpretation of this, for Zechariah in his day, it's the, me it's the, um, the, the nations that were Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. Because those are the ones that had knocked down Israel. Um, and the craftsmen, again, were the greater empire of all those coming together. Because again, Babylon, Medo-Persian, they weren't just one nation. It was more a nation state, like America is a bunch of little states, or how the European Union is a bunch of little states. They were larger congregations of nations going against these minor nations. That's why these craftsmen had the ability to terrify those who were bothering Israel. Because again, they weren't necessarily all bad, because Sir Sirius and Persia lifted up Israel. But we have to remember not to take what they do to Israel as meaning they're good nations. Because again, the Lord will use the wicked to punish, and he will use the wicked to benefit the righteous. So the commentaries on this are really mixed, and I was going through this quite a bit, trying to pick which, which who had the best one. Because, you know, I go to Chuck Smith, he's the Calvary Chapel. Okay, fine. Then you go further back, you go to Spurgeon, and it's, it's different commentaries. And so what you realize is these prophecies are complex. And really, until we see the day that they, they are fulfilled, we probably really won't know 100%. Because one of the things that we often forget about prophecy, the point of these is not to tell us what's going to happen in the future. That's never the point of prophecy. And some people get that confused. That's why when we see prophecy contract, contract it's like, oh, this is what's going to happen. This is what's happening. Yes and no. The point of prophecy is so that when it happens, we look at it and go, oh, wait. God told us this. God knew from the beginning. He said from the beginning what would happen. We didn't see it because we don't think like him. We don't have that worldview. And so before some of these prophecies come true, before revelation happens, it really is your best interpretation based on what you know of the Bible. Because again, when revelation happens, some of these things might happen differently. We may be guessing, you know, something about, I don't know, the Antichrist or something. And it may not be what we think. It's just we're trying our best to interpret what God has chosen to reveal. It is an unveiling in this apocalyptic real, uh, that's why it's an unveiling. It's a slow unveiling, and as you get closer to it, things become readily more clear. Now in Zechariah 2, it goes on to the third vision. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what its width and what its length is. And there was the angel who talked with me going out. And another angel uh, was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run and speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, sit, for I says the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. And so in other words, Jerusalem's going to grow far beyond its boundaries, so far out that it's not going to have walls. You know when that happened? Not till now. The old system of city of Jerusalem had walls. So even after the four years when this was all prophesied and came true, that was around here. And I kind of wanted to bring up another point at this junction when he talks about the future of it happening. It's going to have no walls. It's going to be in the future. Um, because it didn't happen immediately with them. There is a lot of things that happen when you don't take the word of the Lord at its word. There's a thought in church, uh, in some modern churches, and it's been forever, that replacement theology, we may have heard, where all these spiritual promises with, with Israel aren't real. And that's what I was discovering in, when I was reading through these commentaries. Things change significantly based on the year the commentary was written. If the commentary was written pre-1940, it was a very different spiritual take on spiritual Israel. If it was written after 1950, suddenly everyone believed the word of the Lord. Who knew what happened in that time frame? Israel out of nowhere didn't exist. In a very short time, boop, it's back. 
And what happened pre that, people had heard these prophecies like in Zechariah. Christians that would read Zechariah. And the reason I was bringing it up, you have to be careful with how you interpret these things. You can't take too hard of an interpretation on it. Because Christians did at points. Churches did. And in the 1900s, a lot of aberrant cults came up. And some of you may know, some of the big ones. But a lot of those aberrant cults suffered from one major thing. They didn't take the word at its word. And well, the part they didn't take at it was Israel was going to exist in the end. Israel would be a nation. And that's where replacement theology came about. Because again, they weren't diligent in trusting the word to mean what it says. And so they started to figure it out in their own head. What does this mean? How can Zechariah talk about a time when Israel would have no walls? Because pre-1940, Zechariah's promise of a time when Israel would exist as a sprawling metropolis with no walls. What does that mean? Uh, the church is Israel. We're spiritual Israel. We're, we, we have all the promises to the Jews. The Jews no longer exist as a, as a promised covenant-keeping society. God doesn't have to keep his promises to the Jews. It's all for the church. That's what happens. And that's why when we read apocalyptic literature, we have to be very careful. Because right there, he tells them in Zechariah, that one little thing, you get the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're, the, we're Israel, because no Israel exists. You also get the Catholic Church, up until 1940, believing they were spiritual Israel. And this is one thing I do have to give the Catholic Church, because in the Second Vatican Council, after they realized, oh, whoa, Israel existed, they backed off their claim to be spiritual Israel. They actually backed it off. So it's interesting, they were willing to adapt to it. Not completely, but they were willing to take a second look and say, okay, maybe we had that wrong. Apparently papal infallibility wasn't so infallible. Um, and it goes on. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughters of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me. The apple of his eye. That's Israel. You have to be careful when you're messing with Israel. That thought is, who's ever been poked in the eye? Anyone? You flinch immediately? Is it an instant flinch? If I start walking up to you like this towards your eye, what are you going to do instinctually? You might punch me, right? This is what it says. Touch the apple of my eye, for surely I will shake my hand against them. That's like this. You're coming toward his eye. Ooh. To the knee jerk flip. Ooh. Lord can't help it. You attack Israel, he's going to respond. He's going to flinch. That's your poking him right in his eye. So he's telling you here, you've got to be real careful how you treat Israel in general. That's one of the things. Like, There's this whole thing that if you read up anything about evangelicals, one of the things the world likes to say is, we're Christian Zionists. We're Zionists. That's like a bad thing. Here's what I'll say. I don't care what Israel is doing policy-wise. I don't care what atrocities Jewish people may do. I don't care. Because I know they are just as lost as I was. And I also know they have a special place in the Lord's heart. And I'm supposed to have that same place in my heart for what the Lord has in his heart. So I don't know what Israel is doing. I don't care what they do to Palestine. I don't care what people say they do. I know one thing. You poke God in the eye, he's going to punch you. Thank God we have a president who actually acknowledges that. Isn't that amazing? And then you see what happens when the world responds to people supporting Israel. There's a weird thing there, a satanic thing that happens. Because the Lord has Israel's back. The Lord will fight for Israel. That's what we always have to remember because the Lord remembers his people. And the other thing is, I really don't want to be punched by God for poking him in the eye. None of us should. So he goes on. Oh, one of the other things he was telling them about leaving the land, flee from all these other things, drawing the people back. Again, these prophecies really didn't come into play fully until even now. 
the Jews are still coming in from around. So we know that, the, yes, the temple was built within four years, but none of these other greater prophecies actually happened. And it goes on, Sing and rejoice, O daughters of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me, and the Lord will take possession of Judah and his inheritance in his holy land. And he, will again, and he will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. So again, this is a look to the future. This never happened in Zechariah's time. This didn't happen any time yet. Because he's telling them that he, there's going to be a time coming where the Lord is going to dwell in Jerusalem again, where he's going to be among his people. And we see that in Revelation 21. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. That is the prophecy in Zechariah mirrored in Revelation. And I hope that proves the near far view of prophecy, where there was a near revelation for Zechariah, but there is a far view from us and Zechariah's name, it matters. Because through the whole thing, Zechariah's name means God remembers. He remembers. He remembers this promise. And though we may forget it, he's reminding Israel, keep in mind, this is more than uh, 2,500, no, yeah, 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago, the Jews are facing a desolate land, and it's ruined. And he's telling them, I promise you, one day I will dwell among you. And that promise was enough. That promise should be enough for every one of us. That is a promise from the Lord. He will fulfill that promise. And we see it 2,500 years later, I'm still waiting for this day in Revelation. And that's what these people were needed to be reminded of. Though it's dark right now, you're back in your land. The Lord restored you. There's more promises that the Lord has for you. It's not going to be in your time. It's going to be when it's needed. Your job is to be faithful. Your job is to not be your forefathers. Because remember how it started. Don't be like the people that came before you who didn't listen to me. Or how about that? Let's not be like the old man who never was regenerated. How long did you fall into sin before you finally repented? How long did it take you to repent? How long did it take you to turn to the Lord? And this is just a message. Don't be like that again. You can turn to him at any time. It's the same message through the whole Bible. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You have a choice. You can face punishment, or you can face forgiveness. That's all of this. All of this complex stuff, all of this comes down to one thing. Repentance is had at the foot of the cross. The Lord will never turn away a repentant heart. And that's the whole thing he's trying to tell them. He, he reminds these horrible things. He tells these are the bad things that happened to you. But these are my promises. All you have to do is look to me. And that's where we'll end in Zechariah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for prophecy. And we ask that you grant us the wisdom and discernment to understand it, Lord. To be humble enough to admit that we don't understand.